Hi everyone, I'm just going to wait a couple minutes until 10 a.m. to get started. All right, everyone, uh, I'm going to get started right now. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Palmieri. Uh, I am currently a senior studying here at Penn, so it's my last year here. And um, just a little bit about myself before we get started and I talk to you guys a little bit. Um, I have been doing Model UN now for about eight years. I've been doing it since high school. Uh, in high school, I mainly spent my time competing across the country, different universities, different uh, high schools and that was my main involvement. Then I got to Penn and I got more into the organizational part of um, working with conference. So I have been chairing for almost four years now. I've chaired both high school and uh, college conferences. And so it's something that I just really enjoy doing personally. So I hope that we all you know, get to have some good debate, enjoy committee, and yeah, so more about me, I am originally from Los Angeles, and so I moved across the country to go to school. Uh, pretty international background. My parents are both Italian. I went to um, a French international school, so um, a little bit of language diversity there. I'm studying neuroscience, and I'm hoping to become a doctor at some point. So Model UN is a little bit outside of um, what is necessarily like required for me to be a doctor, but it's just something I've always loved and enjoyed. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, what I'm going to be discussing today is um, the legalization of marijuana in the United States. And the reason I'm going to talk about that, there's a few reasons. Number one, it's a very interesting uh, case, case study as far as um, the legalization of, a, of, an, of a, uh addictive substance go. Oh yeah, also, for those of you who do not know how the um, webinar works, I'm going to spend the about first 20, 25 minutes um, presenting uh, my discussion topic, and then I'll spend the last 20 minutes or so um, answering any questions that you guys have, as well as um, uh, any um, like information about what makes a good delegate. So just keep, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. So yeah, uh, the legalization of marijuana in the United States is particularly relevant right now because today, for those of you who don't know, is um, election day, which means that I, once I'm finished with this webinar, will be going out to vote. And uh, what's interesting is that um, on in multiple states there is, um, uh, the legalization of marijuana on the ballot. So what that means is that in different states, people are going to be going to go vote and deciding whether they want marijuana to be legal for recreational use, meaning that they can use it and consume it like people consume alcohol, that there are people who are legalizing it for medical use. So those who have cancer or other conditions could get it prescribed by a physician. And, um, then there are those who are just approving to have um, both. And finally, the final thing that people are approving is to decriminalize marijuana. And what that means is that if you are caught in possession of it, you only receive a small fine, like if you were getting, you know, a parking ticket or something like that, rather than potentially going to jail or something like that. So the current state of uh, affairs is that the use of, a, uh, of recreational medicine, medicinal marijuana is legal in uh, Alaska, Colorado, Washington, 
and uh, Oregon, as well as uh, Washington, D.C., which, while not being a state, has fully legalized it. Um, the cities of Portland and uh, South Portland in Maine, and then Kego Harbor in Michigan, have both also fully legalized recreational medical marijuana. But the recreational sale of marijuana has been banned by Congress in D.C., because for those of you who don't know, D.C. is not a state. So the, um, the country has the final say on the state of their laws. So 12 states, on top of the ones I already mentioned, have also uh, medicinal marijuana. And those st 10 states uh, include Guam and Puerto Rico. And so in those states, you can only use marijuana if you have a prescription from a physician. And then finally, the final 22 states um, and two territories state that marijuana possession and sales are illegal. So you can be pulled over and arrested if you're found to be in possession of marijuana. And actually, an interesting statistic is that over 50% of um, arrests in the United States have to do with possession of marijuana. So um, being that today is election day, like I mentioned, a lot of people around the, wor the world and even around the country are mainly talking about you know, the presidential election. But it's important to know that there are a lot of different other measures on the ballot, especially what's relevant to this committee. And so the reason that the legalization of marijuana is very important to this committee is that um, on the one hand, it has to do with a, the legalization of a substance that has been deemed by the United States to be both addictive and serve no medicinal use because marijuana is listed as a Schedule One drug, which is defined as a drug that has no medicinal use and is at high um, risk for abuse. So that puts it in the same category as heroin, methamphetamine, and uh, some other illicit drugs. And it actually is also um, uh, very relevant for um, the illicit trade of uh, narcotics. The reason being that there are still considerable amounts of marijuana that cross the southern border to get into the United States. And so this is kind of a topic that is relevant to both um, committees. So um, again, uh, as far as the, the chat goes and me answering questions, I'm going to wait till about um, 1020 10:25 to start answering uh, some questions. You guys can type them out, and um, I will answer them later on. Please try to keep the chat to um, purely uh, committee-related discussion. Um, otherwise, you know, it can kind of uh, ruin the webinar for everyone else. Thank you. So, um, but yeah, please feel free to in, uh, type in questions that I will answer uh, about 20 minutes in. So um, to talk about a little bit about my uh, home state of California, because it's very interesting what has happened with the legalization of marijuana there. So it was the first state to uh, legalize marijuana medicinally for cancer patients and otherwise in uh, the early 90s. And since then, it has been a pretty big medicinal product in, the, in California with, uh, with a fairly easy um, access. And um, now what they're aiming to do is um, approve marijuana for recreational use. And so the idea for that is that if the uh, initiative is approved by voters in California today, which more than likely it will be, it's standing about 60% for uh, about 35% against. So if the polls stand, marijuana will be legalized recreationally in California. So it would impose a 15% sales tax on the sales of marijuana with additional taxes on those who grow it. The, uh, the supporters of the initiative um, uh, indicate that it could raise more than a billion dollars in tax revenue and decrease law enforcement costs by about $100 million. So we're talking about a net gain of $1.1 billion. And this is based on the assumption that you sell about uh, $7 billion of marijuana a year, considering that the population of California is the biggest in the country, standing at well over 20 million. It's a reasonable 
assumption to make. So um, more interesting stuff about California is that it has tried to approve marijuana recreationally before, eight years ago, and the, um, the initiative failed. So that also shows how the approval and acceptance of marijuana as a recreational drug like alcohol has shifted in the country. In fact, over 50% of um, the population in the country um, approves of uh, medicinal marijuana. So there is a big push for its legalization, as at least medically. And as far as the ballot goes in the rest of the country, um, California, as like I mentioned, and then Nevada, Arizona, Massachusetts, and Maine will all be voting on improving recreational marijuana, so we would take the number of states uh, where it is approved from four to nine. And the reason that's interesting, and I think it's very relevant to committee, is that the way legalization of marijuana is occurring in the United States is completely um, unique to the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the world, largely because of our very strong federal system where there is the separation of powers between the federal government and uh, the state government. So despite the fact that um, marijuana remains illegal under uh, federal law and you can be imprisoned in federal jail for it, for growing it, for distributing it, the states have gone ahead and um, approved marijuana on their own measures. And just recently there was a, um, a, uh, an announcement from the Justice Department in the United States who said that they would not uh, prosecute uh, those who grow or distribute marijuana in states where it is approved and they have reasonable measures. Because before what had been happening is, for example, in California, where uh, marijuana is approved, there was uh, federal agents, the FBI, who were shutting down marijuana dispensaries despite the fact that the state said it was legal. So just keep that in mind. Um, so this is also relevant to committee because it can sh like provide a potential model for how your country either approves or disapproves of the legalization of addictive sub uh, substances. Uh, in this case, marijuana, which the reason it's been so interesting is that it's the only drug that is illegal at the federal level that has been slowly approved across the country. Alcohol is legal everywhere, and then heroin is illegal everywhere. There is no other drug that has had this like stepwise approval <coughs> in the United States. And so... Um, this all started off under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which listed marijuana as a Schedule I drug. Um, as a Schedule I drug, which is defined by the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they basically have the say on whether a drug is considered dangerous and addictive or not. Um, they have kept it on that schedule. They reviewed the scheduling last year and decided that there was not sufficient evidence to move it off of Schedule I. So, uh, it's up to you as a nation to decide whether you agree with that decision or not. And so I'm going to go back a little bit further in history for how uh, marijuana arrived in the United States, how it has been viewed, so on and so forth. So in uh, the 1500s, the Spanish explorers brought the plant to uh, North America. And by 1611, uh, Marijuana introdu was introduced in uh, Jamestown, which was one of the first colonies, and it quickly became a uh, staple commercial crop. By the 1890s, um, cotton replaced marijuana as the major cash crop, and basically marijuana was no longer that important. Uh, again, as a note, everyone, that I will be answering questions in about um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, so thank you for adding them all into the chat. And just keep in mind that I will be answering your questions, so don't feel like I'm ignoring them. Um, so when alcohol was outlawed in the 1920s in the United States, there was a big resurgence in the use of marijuana as an alternate substance. And at the time, actually, when alcohol was illegal, 
smoking marijuana was legal and not considered a social threat. So marijuana clubs started popping, around, popping up all over the country. Uh, and it was even listed in the United States uh, Guide of Pharmaceuticals until 1942, used to treat a wide variety of ailments, including labor pains, nausea, and rheumatism. But then what happened was that in the 1950s, there was the start of the war on drugs, really, and they started introducing federal mandatory minimums for possession and sale of uh, marijuana. By the 1970s, which was a uh, more intense and liberal time combined with the Vietnam War in the United States, they repealed a lot of the mandatory minimums and focused on harder drugs like cocaine and so on. But by the time that President Reagan, a conservative, came around, he uh, promised to get tough on marijuana use and introduced new federal mandatory minimums <clears throat> for the possession, distribution, and sale of um, marijuana. And that led to a huge spike in the increase in prison population in the United States. So this is where we talk about the concept of mass incarceration, which I think is very relevant to committee which is about balancing the punishment for possession and use and sale of addictive substances with the, um, with the cons of jailing a certain amount of people. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the United States by far has more inmates than any other country in the world. We have more inmates than China, Russia, any country that you can think of. And it amounts to about 1% to 2% of our population is currently incarcerated. And half of those, over half of those in the federal system are incarcerated due to drugs. And <clears throat> after 1996, uh, California Proposition 215 allowed marijuana to be used medicinally, and that kind of sparked the um, revolution in um, legalizing marijuana across the country. So to give you a little bit of statistics on the usage, how widespread it is, and whatnot. So Roger Rothman, a professor of social work at the University of Washington, says that about 3.6 million, so that's about 1% of our population uh, of Americans are nearly daily or daily users. And Peter Reuter at the University of Maryland said that experimenting with marijuana has been a normal part of growing in the United States with about half of the population born in 1960 have tried to use the drug by age 21. And actually, a World Health Organization study found that the United States is the world's leading per capita marijuana consumer. Then in October of 19, I'm sorry, in October of 2016, a uh, Gallup poll indicated that 60% of the adults in the United States supported, I repeat, supported the le full legalization of marijuana. So 60% of the United States is a pretty considerable um, amount of uh, people. So according to the poll, 67% of um, Democrats support legalization. For those of you who don't know, in America we have a largely two-party system with uh, Democrats tend to be a left-leaning party and Republicans tend to be a right-leaning party. And so 42% of Republicans do not. 42% uh, of su Republicans support, so more do not support than do support amongst them. And um, yeah, that's um, pretty much it for the political divide. So keep that in mind when you're um, defending your country's position on the topic. Are you a country with a left-leaning government, right-leaning government, and how does that um, apply to the solutions that you're proposing? So there's about um, five more minutes left in my presentation before I move on to questions. So um, the great majority of cannabis arrests are for possession, not distribution of marijuana, so simply having marijuana on your person. And um, according to the FBI crime report, there have been 12 million, I repeat, 12 million cannabis arrests in the United States since 1996 including 750,000 uh, seven, uh, people for marijuana violations. Of those charged, about 650,000 were charged with possession only, which again can get you jail time. 
which is uh, something to keep in mind. And uh, marijuana arrests compromise about half of all arrests reported in the United States. So interestingly enough, marijuana was the most is obviously the most commonly used illicit drug in 2013, used by about 80 percent of uh, current illicit users. And um, the four states that have legalized marijuana have seen major drops in recreational marijuana prices, which has said to put a dent in the illegal narcotics trade, because if marijuana is legal, it cannot be distributed by um, illegal bodies. So um, about on the flip side, there are about 330,000 people being treated for marijuana addiction at any time. So you have to keep in mind that despite the growing trend in the United States and in other countries to legalize marijuana, it is still considered a drug. It is considered something that um, alters the state of mind. So you have to keep that in mind as far as legalizing. So do you legalize it with taxing? Do you legalize it where you can only have a certain limit? Do you legalize it where you cannot drive under the influence of it? So there are a lot of um, considerations to make outside of just um, do I legalize, do I not legalize? So I think the best delegates will be able to really get into the details about if I decide to legalize this addictive substance and not others, why am I deciding to legalize it? Um, how do I want to go about legalizing it? And how do I work with countries who have, um, uh, who have issue with legalizations, either for you know, uh, religious reasons, political reasons, what have you? So really just keep in mind that as a chair, I don't want to simply hear about my country supports or does not support legalization. It re you really need to get into the details of why, uh, of how it's worked in other countries and what you see has worked and what you want to take from that. Or you might not want to legalize it at all, and you have to explain why you don't want to. So just keep that in mind. So that's the end of uh, my uh, part of the presentation. I'm going to scroll up and find the uh, questions that you guys have sent in and start answering them in order. Feel free to. Um, Add some new ones. So um, let me see. Okay, so the first question I have is that is uh, marijuana has marijuana been said to be good for cancer patients? So there is research out there that marijuana helps with uh, cancer and chemotherapy related pain, depression, suffering. Um, there isn't much research on it because of the difficulty to conduct research in the United States since it is difficult to acquire uh, marijuana legally as a research institution. But for the research that has come out, uh, came out, there is some evidence that it does help with marijuana-related uh, pain. Uh, as far as websites for research, um, some of the suggestions I have are obviously the uh, U official United Nations website, which has all of the... Um, pass resolutions by any committee body in the United Nations. So that way you can see what has been done, you can see the language that they have used, and you can see um, information about the actual special session on drugs that has already occurred. Uh, another website I, um, I tend to recommend outside of the United Nations is I think the New York Times and CNN are both good for um, primary source articles. So if you're just looking for articles describing either the special session on drugs, the state of marijuana legalization, those are two very trustworthy um, sources for articles. And outside of that, it's, um, it's up to your own due diligence to figure out if a website is credible or not. As you all know, Wikipedia does have some credible en entries, but you have to check the source of every um, statement that they make. So don't just blindly copy off Wikipedia because there is a lot of incorrect information out there. Um, as far as the length of the position paper, I believe that is indicated on the style guide. I wouldn't get too hung up on the length, but more focus on the quality and content. Have you um, addressed the questions that the background guide is asking about? Have you presented your country's position clearly? To me, the country position the, uh, and your proposed solutions are a lot more important than the background, for example. Um, how long should a general speaker's list be? Um, that's really up to the discretion of every chair. I tend to not like having a very long speaker's list at one time. I'll usually take um, 10 to 15 
delegates at a time and then add on as time goes along. I usually allow um, delegates to send up a note to me asking to be added to the speakers list if they're not on it and that way it just kind of speeds up the flow of committee. And actually something I really enjoy doing with the speakers list is um, leaving time for questions rather than comments because I think questions are the best ways to debate in Model UN because that way all the other delegates are able to see the issues that you have with a particular argument or not. Whereas I think um, comments don't leave enough room for reply for the delegate. So just something to keep in mind. Um, yes, if you're rep uh, for the delegate representing Bangladesh, definitely mention the laws in your position paper. That would be important. Um, so for the person who asked, uh, who is representing Chile, um, you should not mention, it's impossible, there's not enough room to mention every detail for both topics. So it's up to you to decide um, which um, uh, information is most relevant to your country's position and which resolutions you feel like are most um, important and uh, helpful. There's not enough room to include all the information. Uh, how long should the speech be? So that depends on, on committee really because when we open up committee we are going to set a speaker's time. Usually that runs anywhere from 45 seconds to a minute and a half. So whatever the time is, try to keep the speech up until that time. If you can't, it's better to, for example, if we have a um, speaker's list going on and the speaker's time is a minute 30 seconds, what you can do is if you only think you have a speech for about, you know, 45 seconds, um, what you do is you speak for 45 seconds and then you say, I yield my time to questions. And so the remaining 45 seconds will be used for you to answer other delegates' questions. So that's a really interesting to, way to get um, discussion going. So um, are there any other questions? Otherwise, in, in the meantime, I'll just talk about what I um, enjoy seeing from delegates, what I think makes for a good flowing committee, what I think makes a winning delegate, so on. So like I said, this, uh, this talk that I just gave is a rather interesting case study for the legalization of an addictive sub substance, and I would like to see it used in, um, in, uh, in your speeches and mentioned at some point throughout conference, because I think it's very important evidence to use to show how um, legalization has occurred in you know, the United States. So, um, it's interesting because in the United States it has not been done in one foul swoop, like in Uruguay, for example. We have um, taken time state by state to legalize marijuana. So talk about is that something your country wants to do? Is that something your country doesn't want to do? So on and so forth. Then um, uh, how does your country relate to this issue culturally and politically? There are some countries that are very um, anti-drugs in general and as such will be largely against the legalization of any substance. And so you have to keep that in mind when you are um, uh, presenting your country's position. So you cannot completely stray from what your country believes and I as a chair know what to a large degree every country generally believes about the topic. There is a lot of freedom in how you want to present it, how you want to argue it, but if there is a country that is very obviously from their voting record against the legalization of an addictive substance, um, you should not be saying that you are completely for it. Um, to the delegate asking, should you use all of your information? You should not use it all in your position paper, but you should have it um, on you as research in committee because the more information you have the more helpful it is fundamentally. Um, do you have to include a history of drugs in your position paper? Um, just very brief since uh, you're very limited in space even just one or two sentences is fine. As far as using personal pronouns uh, technically no you should refer to yourself by the name of your delegation so if you are representing Italy for example you would say the delegate, the delegate of Italy, blank, whatever you want to say.
So if you are discussing amongst yourselves in a um, in uh, an unmoderated caucus, feel f you can say I or we, but um, you do not need to end, but you don't need to refer to each other by your real name. I mean, so how to be a uh, a good delegate. So what I stand by is that research is the first and foremost important thing for a committee. You must know um, the stance of your country, you must have evidence to sustain the position of your country, and you should have some information uh, on other major countries so that you can refute their arguments. So as far as bringing laptops, to my understanding, laptops are allowed, but they cannot be used while you're in the committee room. So um, you cannot be in committee typing, looking at your research. You have to be outside of the room if you're typing. We usually recommend to bring your um, research printed or to have notes on it or just to know it. So keep that in mind. For the, uh, for the explanation about position papers, um, all the information is on the style guide. There's really not much that I can say about them. Just make sure that you uh, articulate your country's position accurately. Um, for the person representing Bangladesh, no, you do not need to know all the laws in detail. You just need to know vaguely how your country uh, feels about the illegal narcotics trade and the legalization of addictive substances, what kind of basic laws are in place, and that's about it. And then outside of that, you need to do research on other countries, um, you know, studies that exist about marijuana, statistics, all that kind of stuff. Um, so keep in mind that all research has to be done before committee. So it is always better to have more rather than less information because then you can come to committee prepared and you can be, you can shine as a delegate because you can be a, you know, phenomenal public speaker, but if you don't have information to defend your argument, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are. So once you've gotten to the point where um, you've done your research, and you feel comfortable in the uh, research that you've done, you can start working on, you know, how do I synthesize the research <clears throat> that I've done? How do I bring it all together to support my argument? And that is probably one of the more difficult parts, but also one of the most important parts. Um, what is a working paper? So a working paper is basically a pre-resolution. So a working paper is something that you come up with uh, in committee with fellow delegates to address the issue that we are discussing. And it is written largely like a resolution, but it is not considered a resolution. So what's um, nice about working papers is that you can edit them without going through the amendment process. And the reason that the reason that we can save a lot of time because voting on amendments is a very lengthy process. So if you discuss amendments with the rest of the committee to the working paper that you just want to write in before you submit it as a resolution, it can save a lot of time. And that's something I will explain again in committee. So keep in mind that the, the transformation process goes from um, working paper to resolution, to draft resolution, to then final resolution if it is approved. Um, so back to what I was saying. Um, yeah, so once you've synthesized your research, you want to make sure that you have a couple of ideas for arguments that you want to defend, that you have research to defend those arguments, and that you are ready to um, address the concerns of other delegates in committee. Once you get to committee, oh, so important question, what is a resolution? A uh, Resolution is something that is voted on by a United Nations body that basically recommends certain actions or solutions. Meaning that, for example, in the case of the legalization of um, you know, uh, illicit substances, you could talk about how in your resolution one of your potential solutions is that we recommend to other countries that they increase their research on the medicinal ben benefits of marijuana. And that's one of your clauses. And so it's almost like it's drafted as if it were law, but it is not binding. 
because we are a general assembly body and we do not have the enforcement capability of the Security Council. The resolution needs to be voted on by a majority of the committee to pass, and if it is not voted on by the majority, then it does not pass. Um, I did already re suggest some websites for research. Again, the most I think the most helpful ones are the United Nations official website. Uh, CNN and New York Times are very good for, um, for research as well. Uh, I don't know if the legal committee can benefit from this. I'm not exactly sure as to what exactly you will all be discussing, but you know, take any information from this that you might find relevant. So as far as, again, being a good delegate, once you get to committee, what's really important is to be very cordial and polite to other delegates. Um, chairs never enjoy um, delegates who are, who talk out of tone, talk out of term, who are rude to other delegates, who are rude to the chair. That is a very re easy way to not win. And, um, you know, don't be shy. Talk to the people near you. When other people are not speaking, feel free to chat and discuss committee, discuss whatever you need to talk about, because <coughs> um, something to keep in mind is that, you know, this is diplomacy. That diplomacy is all about talking and discussing with other, other delegates, and that you should not um, forget about that. What is foreign policy? Foreign policy is basically what your country believes as far as its um, work with other countries. Meaning, the foreign po yeah foreign policy is just all the laws and regulations that you have in relation to how you work with other countries. So, for example, it is the foreign policy of the United States to be a part of the of NATO, the National Atlantic Treaties Organization. So that's just one example. Or it is the United States foreign policy to be part of the WHO, the World Health Organization. Those are all examples of foreign policy. So um, as far as what I see in a good delegate, um, I think what's really important is that, first of all, like I said, is that you are polite, you are concise, and that you uh, are very respectful of your of other delegates. After that, when you give speeches, to make sure that you keep your speeches very substantive and do not use it for either personal attacks or just fill it with fluff, meaning that we I really like to hear when speeches have a lot of information, statistics, and it has to be pr presented accurately and with emphasis. So make sure that you are speaking up, that you are, you know, enunciating your words, and so on. And then a couple of other tips for good delegates is that they are leaders in the unmoderated caucuses. So um, I like to see a delegate who takes control of um, what they're doing, but without being rude. Because when you're talking over other delegates, that just looks bad. And um, when we are going to be presenting you know, working papers and resolutions, those who come up to present tend to be the best delegates in the uh, in the room. Um, some tips for first timers, uh, sure, you know, don't be intimidated. I think uh, the first time doing Model UN can be pretty scary and intimidating because there are people who, um, who seem to know what they're doing and there are others who, not, who do not. But first of all, me as a chair, I am here as a source of information and uh, help for all of you. So if you ever have any concerns, questions, or anything that you feel like you don't understand, feel free to ask me. You know, I will be more than happy to explain it. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel afraid. If during an unmoderated caucus you, um, you want to come up and speak to me because you don't understand something, feel free. Send up notes. Uh, I'm here to help. And I like to keep my committee very, um, very organized and um, logical. So I will make sure that it looks very concise, organized, and is very well explained. So that's helpful for people who are, you know, doing Model UN for the first time because they might not know how it works. But I'm going to explain how everything works. I'm going to explain what I expect out of committee. And it's going to be very clear, simple, and you don't have to worry about it. But I think as a first timer, it's really important if, uh, you know, you try to speak and you try to give speeches and you ask um, questions. And I have had some first time delegates who have been some of my best delegates because they're so passionate about what they're doing. So, you know, don't be afraid. Other, if you've done your research, if you've done your, your work, you're ready to give speeches and you're not afraid to speak up, you'll do great.
um, should you keep your uh, research secret? Uh, no, because if you kept your research secret, then you wouldn't really be practicing diplomacy. The reason that you have research is to um, defend your argument and to refute other arguments. So um, your research is a tool. It's not a secret tool. You're not trying to... The United Nations is a collaborative body, not a competitive body. <clears throat> so the... Um, the format of conference is that um, it takes place over, you know, several days. And the way things start is that is that we will first decide um, what topic we want to discuss first. And once we decide what topic we want to discuss first, we will generally talk about the t we'll talk about the topic in general terms for a good amount of time what your country believes, what your country wants to see, so on and so forth. Then after that has occurred, um, what you want to do is um, you're going to start having unmoderated caucuses, which means that you, everyone's going to get up and chat about their country's positions and you're going to form what are called blocks. You can think of them as teams. Once you've formed teams, your team is going to um, work on writing what's called a working paper. So your team or block believes in a common, a few common solutions to the problem that we're discussing. And you're going to write out those solutions. And then over time, you're going to say, you're going to you know, write up your, uh, your working paper. You're going to say, this is what's in my working paper. And then you're, we're going to debate the different working papers. And once they are debated, what will happen is that these working papers uh, will be voted in or not voted in. If they are voted in, that means you simply want to be the, see the working papers debated, right? And if you don't vote them in, then that means you don't want to see the working papers debated, which rarely happens. Finally, you can submit um, a working paper as a draft resolution, which means, and this is also has to be voted on, when you submit a working paper as a draft resolution, that means you want to see the paper debated in voting block, uh, before voting block as a resolution. Finally, and also when you submit something as a draft resolution, that means it can only be amended via the amendment process after that. And then finally, once we vote on something being a draft resolution and it has been discussed, um, we will go into voting block and we will vote on uh, amendments first. And after we have voted on amendments, we will vote on resolutions and that's committee. Um, how do you get points? Um, I don't really necessarily assign physical points, but the way to get, you know, points in the mind of the chair, me, is to, you know, speak every time you get the opportunity to, to be a leader, to be, um, to know your research, to work with other delegates, to present unique and innovative solutions. Um, how many model UNs have I been to? I have chaired seven times now. And I have been to eight conferences. Yeah, that sounds about right. So this is something I know a lot about, something I have a lot of experience with. Um, when do you give speeches? From the first, from the minute that you get into committee, once we start talking about which um, topic we want to debate, um, we, um, you're giving speeches. You say, I think we should debate this topic. And then once we choose which topic we want to debate, we say, well, this is what I think about the topic. So speeches start from the very first moment. So an obviously um, important thing is making sure you know, the chairs know who you are. Because if you stand out to the chair as, um, as a delegate, as a team worker, then that will, will remember that. And that will help you win conference. So if we don't, if you don't speak up, if we don't know who you are, it's very difficult to, um, to win. So just keep that in mind. As far, oh, content in the speech, that's a good question. Um, uh, speeches, the content of speeches largely depends at the moment of committee we're in. So what I would say is when we are debating which topic to discuss, you should include in your speech which topic you want to discuss and why. Why do you think it's more important? <clears throat> um, when we get into debating the topic, you want to discuss um, what your country feels about the topic and what you think some potential solutions are. Then as time goes by, you want your speeches to address 
other problems with the topic, and you want to address um, disagreements with other countries' positions on the topic. Then, um, over time, you're going to discuss what you are working on in your working paper. Then you'll be discussing what's in your resolution. And yeah, that's pretty much the content of speeches. So the general speakers list is something that is um, used in General Assembly. And so what, um, what that means is that once we open up committee, I'm going to take down names or countries of delegates who wish to speak. And then I'm going to write them down in order. And people are going to come and speak up in that order. Oh, so general, what I mean by general speakers list is that it's literally a list of countries, names, that I will be taking down. So I'm going to ask who wishes to speak. And the countries who want to speak will raise their placards. And so I will write down the name of your country in order. And then once it is your turn to speak, I will call you up. I will say, we will now hear from the delegate from China. The delegate from China will come up and the delegate from China will give their speech and I will time the speech. Um, does your vocabulary have to be complex? No, just use vocabulary that you're comfortable with. Just don't be vulgar or crude and make sure that it's an academic level of um, vocabulary. How do you start a speech formally? You know, that stuff you can look up. That stuff you can... Uh, it's just, you know, you can introduce your country. I'm the delegate from China, and today we are talking about the legalization of illicit substances, and this is what my country believes. So, yeah, general speakers list is just, like I said, general speeches about the topic. So, um, does anyone have any um, uh, final qu Okay, there are a few final questions. Um, maximum number of speakers on the list. I usually don't like having more than 15 to 20 at a time. So I will usually announce, I am not taking any more speakers at this time. We'll go down the list, and then I'll say, I am now taking more speakers, and write down more people. Do you have to use complex vocabulary again? No, just make sure it's vocabulary relevant to committee, and that it's not vulgar or crude vocabulary. So if there are no last questions, um, oh, can there be two people in the same country? Um, depending on the... Uh, committee. There can be dual delegations. I'm not actually sure if our if special session on drugs is a dual delegation committee, but I don't believe so. So um, more than likely, no. It's only one person per country. How long is the speech? That depends. It ranges anywhere from 45 seconds to a minute 30, depending on what the committee sets the speech length to be. <clears throat> so if you guys have any further questions, feel free to email them to me or to Isle Monk in general. The, um, the email address for that is, I, I will type it in for all of you, so you know who to email if you have any other questions. Um, so if you have any uh, questions, feel free to send it to uh, that email, and it was really nice. Uh, this com sorry, the last question I'll answer. Does complex vocabulary give you extra points? Um, it can. It can make you look like a well-educated, uh, well-speaking delegate. So you know, feel free to use as complex of vocabulary as you want. Um, so again, thank you so much to everyone for listening. I honestly cannot wait to meet all of you and work with you in committee. And honestly, based on my experience with committee, I'm sure we're all going to have a great time, great time with debate, and that you're all going to walk out thinking it was one of the best conferences you've ever been to. So um, I look forward to meeting all of you. Oh, did the email not send? I will try again. If it didn't send, um, tell me if it sends now. Uh, I do. I cannot give out my personal email, but I will give out the India email. Did it work now? All right. It looks like the email has sent. So thank you again, everyone. Have a uh, nice time, and I look forward to seeing you at conference.